Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar, A Modern Digital Data Architecture, Best Practices for Adoption. My name is Brett Carpenter, the Marketing Strategist at Zaloni, and I'll be your MC for this webcast. Our guests today are Clark Bradley, a Solutions Engineer at Zaloni, and joining us from DXC Technology is Alex Gurevich, their Chief Technology Officer of Analytics for the Americas. We'll have time to answer your questions at the end of the presentation, so don't hesitate to ask them at any point using the Ask a Question box located just below the player window. You'll also notice a poll given during the webcast. When the time is ready, please use the Vote tab, also located below the player window, to participate. Now, our agenda today is going to include a brief introduction of DXC Technology and Zaloni, followed by the benefits of a modern data architecture and the top three use case patterns seen by our experts. Finally, we'll be closing it out with some Q&A. Now with that, I'll turn it over to Clark and Alex as they discuss the best practices for adopting a modern data architecture. Guys? Thanks, Brett. Thank you, Brett. Hi folks, this is Alex Gurevich. Um, we'll take a quick second just to introduce ourselves and um, our joint uh, companies and the partnership that uh, is the exciting genesis for this webinar. Uh, my name is Alex Gurevich. As Brett introduced, I'm the Chief Technology Officer for Analytics in the Americas. I represent DXC Technology, uh, a company that uh, you may not be familiar with uh, by current uh, labeling, but it's uh, a new company, but not born yesterday, as we say. It is the genesis of the merger between Hewlett Packard Enterprise uh, Services and CSC, formed um, almost two years ago now. And uh, it is uh, the third largest service company uh, in the world today. So a lot of the work that we do uh, brings uh, IT services and uh, digital transformation capabilities to our uh, customers across the world. Clark? Thanks, Alex. Um, and my name is Clark Bradley. I'm a solutions engineer in pre-sales uh, with Zaloni. Um, and so Zaloni also is, was born out of uh, services in the in the big data era and then uh, productized all of, all of our learnings there. And so we like to look at this around three different pillars, around being able to enable the data lake with different capabilities from ingestion to transformation governing the data platform through tight integration with uh, security and authorization, uh, but also securing that data. And then finally engaging with the business through a variety of self-service tasks that make uh, getting access to the data easy. And so all these different capabilities help companies to modernize their approach to operationalize uh, their business processes. So. For DXC and Zaloni, this just feels like a very natural fit for our joint customers to be able to optimize the value of their data and provide a clear path to digital transformation. Great. Thanks, Clark. So one of the things that uh, DXC and Zaloni have done is uh, as part of a, a broader offering uh, by DXC for their analytics uh, and AI platform where we deliver platform services, the supporting services end-to-end -end from all consulting to design, development, deployment, as well as the run operate services. We have uh, aligned our platform services to include um, Zaloni as part of the core component of our uh, platform environment uh, that really focuses on the enhanced data management and self-service. Uh, some of the things that Clark just mentioned, Zaloni is really focused on and best in breed on. Uh, as part of the, uh, the DXC capability, we wrap a lot of those services and capabilities that Zaloni brings with the actual environment management, uh, whether on-premise or in the cloud, as well as the uh, new age data lake constructs that are supported by the Hadoop technologies and cloud native uh, deployments within the public cloud, as well as private cloud and hybrid uh, deployments. And then, of course, expanding that to the consumption and the usage of that data by BI systems, uh, integrations with the operational production uh, implementations, as well as the 
uh, application development that sits and leverages the uh, advanced analytics and artificial intelligence that are derived from the data that are consumed. Clark? Yeah, Alex, and I, I think that's where Zaloni fits perfectly in with, with the types of services and solutions the DXC is providing is that we're right there in the center, uh, just above the, uh, the data layer and in between the application layer, is that what we provide is a, is a management and governance layer that allows users to uh, automate and collaborate across their data. And so some of the key benefits there that, that I would point out is uh, number one around integrated metadata is that uh, uh, there's a lot of different varieties in, in catalogs that are available on the market, but what we found that our customers need is an actionable data catalog. And for that, you've got to be able to integrate with the business, the technical, and the operational metadata. And so that's everything going in, on in the environment. The business and the technical allow the IT and the business folks to be able to better contextualize and understand uh, the data through the discovery process, and then operationalizing the metadata um, coming out of different transformations and preparation tasks and provisioning tasks uh, gives clear line of sight of where the data started and where it finished up. Second point uh, is around um, providing a, a simplified set of tools and, and automation is that these tasks can take uh, weeks, if not sometimes months. Uh, just something as simple as accessing data uh, can be a lot more onerous than, than one would hope for. <laughs> but uh, in, in our customers and, and the organizations that we've worked with, um, the ability to seamlessly integrate the hydration and the profiling, the gathering of descriptive statistical data on the data so that, that understanding starts as early as possible uh, can really help kickstart uh, many organizations, large and small, uh, data lake projects uh, much, much faster than trying to pull all these pieces and parts together alone. Thanks, Mark. And then the, the, the whole concept here is that although we are obviously uh, DXC and Zalomi, uh, the platform and services that we built out are representative of what we believe are the best practices associated with building solutions for the modern digital transformation age. The end-to-end -end capability is critical to managing the platform deployments. And the time to market that's uh, associated to that is the result of uh, optimizing the tool sets and the capabilities that those tools uh, represent in an integrated fashion. So the idea of having a one simplified out-of-the-box solution that can be deployed across multiple environments, hybrid especially, but optimized also for cloud and very important in the transformation, many of our customers are migrating from one environment to another, adopting new environments as an extension, and in some cases, uh, transitioning towards uh, changing their operations uh, to be optimized across the new environment and choose a new paradigm of operation, including constructs like the data lake as opposed to a uh, traditional data warehouse approach. You know, as, as part of the uh, things that we've already built out, we wanted to give uh, a quick heads up on some of the things that we also are moving towards and some things that are just around the corner of where these types of platforms and capabilities are evolving to. So as we uh, maybe move to the next slide, we can talk about some of the innovations and enhancements that um, are constantly evolving, and this is the direction that they're headed. Yeah, that's that's a good uh, handoff there, Alex. You know, we're we're working across three key trends um, over the short term here, and so we label these as connect versus collect, uh, personas rule, and data intelligence. And so, in the connect versus collect, uh, this is all about that discovery of data. You know, really, really helping users to understand the data. Uh, versus just having uh, larger and larger quantities of data. And so for this, uh, being able to uh, split processing uh, seamlessly across uh, different uh, cloud environments to be able to catalog file systems, uh, applications, RDBMS, and, and really understand 
uh, by doing you know, both previews and data ingestion, uh, help users to get that better understanding of their data. Uh, we'll be adding uh, additional seamless capabilities around auto-scaling of Spark clusters. So as different data pipelines and flows get built out, being able to automatically in, in real time uh, scale that you know, from 2 to 200 nodes uh, or to scale back uh, as processing at nighttime doesn't need as much uh, are going to be key components there. Uh, also, data access and federation, so being able to leverage that catalog and being able to, uh, across a number of different environments, uh, seamlessly connect and relate data sets uh, is another key feature that really helps uh, users understand data that's been siloed either due to different uh, business areas uh, or for merger and acquisition to be able to, to gather that data together uh, to determine usage for a business task they're working on. Under Persona's rule, um, this is more aimed towards all the different roles, the diversity of roles that we see uh, across environments. Uh, you've got uh, data engineers, you've got data scientists, a uh, new role that, that popped up a few years ago, citizen data scientists, which were business analysts that were leveraging more predictive analytics in an automated way in order to take advantage um, of skills that they had, data stewards on the, on the data governance front, data analysts, right? So there's lots of different roles. And for them to be able to achieve what they're working on, having different tools that don't quite connect, that don't quite share metadata is really uh, can create gridlog, gridlock in any different uh, business process that's being worked on. So we're going to be aiming to uh, further add end-to-end -end capabilities for each persona. So being able to connect to like Jupyter Notebooks to seamlessly pull in uh, Python or R code uh, to operationalize it through a data pipeline is a, is a good use case there. Furthering self-service data ingestion and publishing. So this is where users can bring the skills that they have rather than having to learn a new skill to get up and running in a particular environment, providing wizard-based or drag-and-drop interfaces that let users uh, really uh, take what they know, the business requirements, and apply it without having to have the technical know-how. Advancing our global search and catalog capabilities uh, further adds uh, metadata enrichment for an easy-to-find experience. So as users go into an environment, rather than having to uh, scan across different catalogs, or if you're a data engineer, look deep into a transformation and a workload, Leveraging the global search will allow them to pull out those pieces and parts that will take them directly to uh, the task or the uh, particular data item that they need. Uh, and then finally, extensible user actions here. So, you know, going back to the personas, data scientists want to uh, do more code-based activities. <clears throat> Excuse me, and business analysts need more activities uh, on a UI or visualization scale. So we're going to allow them to be able to extend those actions out uh, through customized actions so that they can build them onto the application uh, for whatever their needs are. The last piece of our theme is data intelligence, which is a really exciting area for, for data management. Um, for it seems like eons now, Alex, uh, different folks working in analytics have had predictive analytics and machine learning, you know, is nothing new, but in the data management space, being able to take the information that we have today, workflows that, that have been built, uh, different tasks that have been operationalized, along with the descriptive statistics that we receive from profiles of different data sets and the knowledge that we can pull from the systems that those data sets uh, reside currently in, is going to allow us to make smart suggestions. So we'll be able to leverage machine learning capabilities in order to take the information that we have, look across history for uh, activities that have been occurring in the environment, and help users get a kickstart as they onboard into an environment to be able to make those smart suggestions. So this will also help with uh, duplicate ingestion forensics. We won't have to hopefully know once the data lands that it's duplicated and we don't need it, right? We'll be able to look across the profiles and say, hey, I don't think we want that data here. Um, and then finally, you know, as we described earlier in the personas rule, the data science notebook integration. Um, in today's world, we, we have more custom written transformations that we can operationalize any type of procedural code that 
uh, will land in the data lake. And we want to make that more of a seamless experience so that as users are working with their favorite uh, coding tool sets, uh, they'll be able to connect a module into our environment where we will seamlessly add that into a workflow and then operationalize it, schedule it, or, or have it event-based to kick off later on so that uh, work by the citizen data scientist and the data scientist can easily be scheduled in the environment. Perfect. So l let's just jump right into uh, some of the use case patterns that we want to talk about because the things that we're describing I think will come up over and over again in context, but we want to take the time to walk you through what we see are the core uh, use case patterns that we're seeing most of our customers uh, struggle with. And uh, you, even though there are different ways to address many of these, uh, we kind of created these three buckets of a hybrid data lake, uh, which essentially is the idea that you're migrating from a typically an on-premise environment to a, let's say, a cloud environment, and either during the duration of that project or perhaps uh, as a permanent state, you'll wind up uh, maintaining both of those environments to operate against and the challenges associated with that. Um, the enterprise data warehouse to data lake addresses the paradigm shift of moving from a traditional structure first, then load, then use approach of a data warehouse, uh, mostly organized around traditional structured data, and moving towards the paradigm of a data lake, uh, as well as the challenge often faced now of adopting cloud in that same context. And then the idea of a greenfield cloud environment is uh, embracing that uh, new digital capabilities of the cloud and some of these new technologies and building new capabilities in those environments in context of other uh, data sources and other capabilities that may come from outside of that greenfield environment. So one of the things that we wanted to do is um, take a poll, which of these patterns describes your most critical focus. So as maybe we uh, continue talking about this, uh, we invite the folks to execute uh, the, the um, and trigger off on the response. We'll take a quick minute to let you do that. And then while we do that, uh, Clark, anything you want to add about these three patterns in uh, terms of what you're seeing in the marketplace and how Zelonius uh, reacted to this? No, these are good ones. Um, we've, we've seen uh, over the past couple of years that definitely uh, personalized data security has become a, a trigger for a lot of these uh, movements to the cloud. and uh, whether you're talking about a, a hybrid environment where you're kind of straddling your on-premise environment and a new cloud environment, or you're trying to move wholesale to a cloud, or you're, you're brand new to the cloud. You, you don't even know where you want to start. You might be a, a small business unit, and so that's a great place to start with data, database as a service and uh, uh, some small uh, DevOps-type tasks against that data. Um, these are the ones that, that we predominantly see out there, and they all bring their own set of challenges to the game. Excellent. And, you know, it looks like uh, based on the participation, uh, as, as expected, uh, the order of these use cases is approximately uh, how, how we see them positioned in the marketplace. Most folks are uh, what, whether by choice or by uh, compliance, are embracing a uh, hybrid data lake kind of strategy. Um, many of them are moving towards specifics of uh, the traditional warehouse to data lake migration, and uh, a few are, have the ability and, frankly, the, um, uh, the benefit of starting with a greenfield without necessarily having to um, worry about some of the legacy uh, transitions of um, previous deployments. So, and with that, yeah, I I agree, and, and we see a couple of others coming in there. So, if, if uh, from the audience, if you want to put some feedback on what those others are, we'd love to have a conversation around it. Great. So, let's just jump into um, a little bit more discussion on the first use case. You know, the, uh, the idea here is that the, uh, the use case pattern of hybrid data lake really addresses two things. Uh, one is, of course, the idea that 
there is an on-premise versus a cloud uh, environment, so the paradigm shift of adopting a cloud uh, operation. And then, of course, the, uh, the challenges of uh, technology as well as physics of connecting to the cloud and adopting some of the different technologies that are unique to the cloud or that maybe don't transfer well from uh, on-premise, like an appliance-based solution that uh, many customers uh, have in place today, whether it's uh, traditional Teradata or Netiza or Exadata appliance, which did a great job for what they were targeting to do at the time, uh, and then moving to either uh, a similar type workload in the cloud um, or moving towards, uh, you know, a, tra uh, a transition of uh, a data lake that may have been deployed as a Hadoop data lake on-premise and moving that Hadoop environment uh, to the cloud and interacting across those technologies and environments. So one of the things that we very much see is a gap in the metadata uh, management. And again, uh, for DXC, this was a clear opportunity to partner with a best-in-class uh, partner like Saloni because we believe very strongly that it's the amp part of the answer, if not a, you know, maybe a significant part of the answer, towards democratizing the data access, managing it, simplifying it towards the goal of a self-service uh, single pane of glass kind of uh, operation that allows users to know where the data is, access it, make sure that they access it within governed uh, criteria that are built in up front as opposed to bolted on after the fact, and do it in a way that essentially minimizes the complexities of where such environments operate, whether they're on-premise or whether they're in the cloud. Clark, can you add there? Yeah, I mean that that last bit that you said is, is you know probably the key bit is you know wherever they they are are operating because that's really not important to the business user. I mean they want to get things like scalability and performance out of it, but not be bogged down with having to deal with different types of data formats and having to deal with uh, different processing paradigms, you know, distributed or sequential, and different languages and, and things that can really hamper development. Because at the end of the day, we're trying to get to to business insights. Um, so some important recommendations there are around knowing your data. Um, it, it wasn't long, that long ago that I, the data lake was essentially defined as as Hadoop, and then as we saw different distributions come up, and those distributions form. Uh, their own formatting of data and their own processing paradigms to go with those environments. Um, it was never exclusionary to the databases. They were always included and there was some form of integration between the data warehouse and the data lake needed in order to, to make these environments work. And as we move into cloud, uh, that data lake term gets even more broad uh, as we include Hadoop and RDBMS and files and streams and S3 and Azure Blob and uh, data as a service like Snowflake and Redshift, um, there's a variety of different pieces and parts. And so it's important to, to know your data and to have proper context. And so uh, that's where a catalog is extremely important uh, and an actionable data catalog, which I'll explain in a minute. But a catalog is important to give those different roles that we talked about earlier, the data scientists, the data analysts, the business analysts, data stewards, data engineers, their proper context of the data for understanding it. But more importantly, we need to be able to take action on that data. Just having reference of the data is certainly important, but what are we going to do with the data? Where is it going? What is it supporting? Is it static reporting? Is it uh, predictive analytics? Um, is it actionable off of some stream of data that we need to make a decision very quickly in real time? Uh, all those different pieces and parts are important. And so by understanding that data, that's what's going to help lead to action. You know, whether we're going to be applying data quality or, or uh, securing personalized data with masking and transformations uh, and tokenization of data or providing preparation, you know, in a context of uh, a pipeline for a data engineer or a wizard-driven interface uh, for self-service uh, for a more analyst-type role. So finally, uh, another important recommendation here is around the governance of the data. 
Um, so when moving to a cloud environment, being able to support a hybrid cloud environment, being able to have governance over both environments, on-premise and hybrid and the cloud, uh, are important because users need to be able to log in and be able to perform some level of work, but they might need to be able to transfer that work or split that work between the two environments. Um, so this is, again, you know, going back to the catalog, having that unified uh, vision of all the data in both environments, being able to take action off of it. So let's say that we want to secure or merge some data in the on-premise environment before we bring it over to the hybrid environment to support a, a report or a visualization. Um, users need to be able to have that tool set that allows them to leverage the best parts of both environments while still obfuscating the more complex aspects of it with respect to data processing and formatting of data. Yeah, Clark, and I think the whole idea here is that uh, the goal has to be business oriented, right? The idea that these are technology solutions to business problems and business challenges. And uh, there was a question uh, that came across that says, you know, some about criteria about choosing what type of uh, cloud solution or what kind of uh, pattern to use. In, in general, I would say all of these uh, have to reflect your business goals. How are you going to measure success based on business outcomes and then ensuring that those uh, successes can be executed in a simple, uh, cost-effective, and um, efficient, operationally efficient uh, way? And these are patterns that we find that address those challenges in the case of the hybrid data lake. Um, as we move on maybe to the next slide and show an example of how something like this fits in a specific deployment. Um, the idea here is that we're using an Azure example here. Um, this can be AWS, it could be Google. Um, DXC has patterns of deployment of those platform uh, components. Uh, we can uh, certainly help uh, identify which components are necessary for what type of use case, whether it's deep learning uh, algorithmic uh, you know, advanced analytics or whether it's uh, traditional BI or any uh, hybrid version thereof. But in the end, the idea is that what's common across most customers is the, the on-premise version of a data lake that may actually, to be uh, quite uh, blunt, is more of a data swamp that's been hydrated but maybe not optimized very well for usage and folks are having trouble extracting content and monetizing the value that's in the, uh, in the data, so they're not quite using it as an asset yet. And then uh, embracing the flexibility of the cloud as part of uh, the digital transformation, but really the big defining change is the adoption of that data catalog uh, and the idea that you are exposing the data to your user community creating the automation that simplifies and optimizes the data pipes associated to the processes behind the scenes, and then facilitating the use and the embedded uh, application of that data towards a business value. Clark? Yeah, and so this, uh, this architecture res uh, reflects a, a sample use case that we have uh, in the banking industry. And um, all these pieces and parts uh, are largely optional. They're, they're here to reflect uh, the business case, but aren't required components. So I want to make sure that, that I point that out. Um, in our environment for, for Zaloni, as far as processing, uh, we leverage most of the time Spark, about 90% of the time it's Spark, uh, with some, some MapReduce and some Hive uh, being used if they're Hadoop environments. Um, and so here what we see is that Zaloni uh, could be installed either on-premise and accessing directly the on-premise Hadoop cluster and then remotely um, the Azure environment, or it could be installed in Azure and going back the other way through a virtual private network uh, to the on-premise environment. We don't, uh, that architecture is usually uh, recommended based on um, locality of data, access, uh, security, um, and, and scalability and some other features that we work with customers on. But largely what you can take away here from this, this example is the business case 
is that the bank wants to discover new opportunities in their data. So this goes across all their financial data, um, mortgages, loans, uh, credit card information, bank, um, bank records, and things like that. And so they want to look to be able to see things like if, uh, if a customer has a mortgage, uh, offering them a new line of credit or maybe offering them financial planning if they hit a certain threshold. And so for that, um, their technical challenges here uh, were largely around scalability, is that they had basically hit as far as they wanted to go with investment of uh, Hadoop infrastructure. And so being able to save money on cost as far as expanding infrastructure and getting cheaper storage on cloud as well as the uh, locality of being able to regionalize uh, different reporting and, and visualization uh, automatically by landing that data in uh, different regions of the cloud uh, made a lot of sense to them. So here what we do is, is work to create that, you know, like we talked about earlier, that one understanding of all the data across the environments so that we get a clear picture of what's on premise uh, and what state is it in. Is it, is it raw data? Has it been uh, transformed and trusted into an enterprise data set? Has it been refined into a business case? Um, and as the data migrates over into the Azure data uh, cloud, you know, what does it represent there? And so we follow a full zone-based architecture, which is important, um, through the Azure Data Lake storage system to transition that data from its raw state all the way through to its business case uh, or even a sandbox for analytic development. Thanks, Mark. And one of the things that you uh, obviously struggle with as, um, tr as you transition into this typically is the idea of which tools, which environments set up in what way, what kind of management do you have to set up around this? Uh, how do you select the right resources within Azure to execute on? How do you manage and monitor uh, all of these things? This is a, a level of uh, managed services that is really key, whether you're developing this in-house, uh, which takes uh, usually quite a ramp up, and, uh, or if you're outsourcing this as a managed service, this is where uh, DXE has built a lot of uh, expertise and services around that helps you, again, in the same way that you are simplifying the use of data, uh, we are expanding that to the simplification of the use of these platforms, deployment, and uh, for example, one of the services we have is an Azure migration factory where there's on-premise expertise about the environments that you have to, uh, currently, as well as target environment expertise, and the operationalizing of that migration through repeated blueprints and best practices that have been validated and proven in. Uh, th this sample architecture, uh, as Clark said, has some components that may be optional for your particular use case, but this is an example of uh, an actual client type uh, solution that has been deployed and implemented in this particular way, and many of those uh, consulting and advisory um, components are uh, services that can be brought in from DXC and Saloni to support you. Uh, and if not from us, then I urge that uh, you do bring a partner, an SI, and an expert uh, uh, vendor uh, to support you in this because it is quite a ramp up, and this is where uh, building on success is critical as you move on and explore further types of uh, leverage of these environments. So with that, uh, maybe we can uh, continue the same discussion and then just use the context of the next use case uh, pattern um, and move on to the uh, EDW uh, transition use case. And the key here is that this is the typical use case of uh, you may never have had a Hadoop cluster in place uh, or that's not what you're trying to transition to uh, or from rather. Uh, today you have an EDW, whether again a classic uh, appliance-based uh, deployment or whether some of the more modern uh, MPP solutions, maybe distributed compute, but still on-premise still leveraging the traditional paradigm of pre-schema of the data, uh, ETL uh, processes typically outside of the environment, moving the data into a pre-structured environment, and then exposing that environment through traditional query-based and BI tool sets, uh, which 
as long as it's serving your business needs today, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. However, what we're seeing is that the new technologies offer new paradigms of uh, usage patterns that are more conducive to the data lake approach of store once, use many times by many different users with either multiple schemas or perhaps even schema on demand. And the idea that uh, transitioning from the pre-structure of the data, pre-harmonizing it, pre-processing it, to keeping the data as whole and as original as possible, and then making the uh, changes to suit the specific business needs of the different business communities, which especially in analytics and AI uh, are more conducive to as much of the raw data access as possible. And then the idea that as you're moving into these environments, you're also adopting the construct of cloud uh, to expand the flexibility, the scalability, and the elasticity of some of the cloud paradigms. The uh, transition to that paradigm of uh, EDW to data lake is a challenge of its own. The transition of on-premise to cloud is yet another uh, paradigm shift, and this is a cultural change for many companies as well as a technological change. Clark? Yeah, I, I, I agree with, with all those challenges. We see quite a few of them. And, you know, from a recommendation standpoint, uh, what we work with uh, different organizations on is to allow them to bridge those silos coming out of the enterprise. There's, you know, lots of tools, and as those new capabilities become uh, available, adding them on to uh, the existing infrastructure can sometimes be harder than it is just bringing, just using the new tool itself, right? Is that if the if the metadata doesn't integrate and it does not uh, provide clear path to uh, auditability of the processing that's taking place in the environment, um, it can be difficult, even though it's added new capabilities. And so it's you know again leads back to having that unified metadata management to be able to provide a single actionable catalog that allows users to find uh, all of their data and being able to uh, have clear visibility of the data. And so lending towards that is having a, a marketplace experience for business users uh, in their data. So rather than having to, uh, at its you know most bureaucratic state, uh, fill out forms and submissions to get data added to a common place to be able to just go look and, and access and touch the data, um, having an instant view of that data and a shopping cart experience where you can select those different assets and take them to, you know, the specific spot where you want to do that processing, right? Whether it's unstructured data or structured data, they uh, specific spots that will optimize that experience. And so that optimization of transformation is, is another uh, key recommendation when transforming from the EDW is that uh, as the EDW gets built up more and more and more, uh, largely those, those transformations can slow down and it gets harder and harder to meet SLAs as data volumes grow. Uh, and there might not be, like Alex said earlier, uh, Hadoop infrastructure in place to support unstructured data. So then that's just more infrastructure that, that needs to be added to it. So being able to take advantage of distributed processing um, in a cloud environment that's scalable uh, and uh, is less costly, you know, makes a lot of sense uh, for customers to be able to transition there and be able to parallelize their data loads and take advantage of zone-based architecture to, on the IT side, better understand the, the current state of data uh, for access by the users. And then from the user standpoint, knowing what data is trusted that they can leverage for different business insights. Um, yeah, another one, recommendation. One thing that I wanted to, so, sorry, Clark. Uh, one thing I want to just uh, highlight uh, what yeah. Clark just said about the uh, the different zones is the idea that uh, a pattern that we're seeing with users uh, at uh, enterprises now is the definition of production has been kind of stretched and expanded from the traditional. Uh, many of these environments are exposing and joining data across sources that are not traditional to what we call legacy production operations. So this uh, includes different types of formats of data, so unstructured formats, whether it's sensor logs from your IoT environments or IT logs from your uh, back-end system operations, uh, but also inclusive things like uh, weather data, social data, 
uh, perhaps even video content, all, all of that becomes usable by the enterprise in production grade usage, but not necessarily uh, always embedded into your operations uh, holistically. So there's data scientists who are exploring and evaluating data. They need high quality, high grade enterprise capable uh, environments. And then based on their operational usage of that data and proving in the value of that data, that result can be embedded back into your systems. In order to enable all of those different usage patterns and users across your deployments uh, within the enterprise, you have to have those different sandboxes, your uh, different sets of governance, flexibility, and that is where the power of the cloud really comes into play because you can spin up these environments, you can feed additional resources into them, and you could still expose them with that common data catalog and that data democratization that exposes the viable usage of all the data assets that you have in place across the different patterns of production grade uh, deployments. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. So, you know, just to, to sum up those last two points, it's it's all about automation and collaboration. For collaboration, organizations need to have a self-service strategy as part of their data strategy to enable uh, business users uh, that, that don't necessarily have the skills in order to, to build deep pipelines and uh, procedural code to be able to uh, work within the environment seamlessly. And then on the IT side, being able to leverage movement of storage from hot to warm to cold so that they can save on uh, cost of infrastructure uh, is extremely important. Yeah, so let's, let's jump, jump into the uh, architectural view of this use case. And a lot of the value of uh, all of these use cases is the automation and the simplification of these deployments. So whether the sources in the past were going into uh, an EDW through multiple separate tool sets and different environments with maybe even separate metadata management, if any, and the idea that you had very disparate processes that you had to become very familiar with and in many cases have the right security access to, the idea that all of these things become a little bit more automated and simplified for the end user, including IT management uh, of these environments, is one of the keys uh, to success. Focusing on that simplification and automation up front reduces the effort of automating it uh, later on. And adopting the tool sets that are conducive to that, uh, especially tool sets that allow you that single pane of glass capability of developing those pipelines with that automation, with that auto generation of metadata upon ingestion, uh, really gives you that flexibility. And that is one of the valued uh, propositions and the criteria by which uh, you start adding uh, value to the selection of the tools. Yes, you can use an existing uh, IT tool set for ETL, but does it give you the value add of the data lineage across your, all the different environments and can you pass the data lineage into some kind of a searchable, accessible data catalog that users um, can use to understand the impact of their uh, downstream application development or perhaps just a uh, correlation uh, understanding of how their data correlates to other data in the environment from different source systems. Yeah, that's, that's a great overview. This, this comes from a customer in the transportation industry that was looking to optimize supply chain. So they get a variety of different data. So structured, unstructured, semi-structured, coming from partners, joint ventures, third parties, and, and even some, uh, some existing data. Bring your own data in order to help enrich and add to that. And so being able to have a flexible and scalable environment for them that can work with multiple formats of data was exactly what they needed to support their business process. Yeah, and one of the things that uh, is also important is really an understanding, uh, especially when we talk about migrations, an understanding of the source system uh, technology and the expertise of that environment as you're migrating towards the new. So for example, if you're migrating from a um, again, like a Teradata environment, understanding what's unique and uh, about Teradata is very important as you start selecting and 
redesigning and choosing the strategy of what I'll call lift and shift versus redesign versus lift and shift and then redesign. In some cases, moving the processes as is is viable, but does it offer you the benefit of changing your business operations, or are you just changing one horse for another? Does it offer you better cost efficiencies, better scalability? In many cases, it is just as important to prioritize and pull up the, uh, the value of redesign into your process as it is getting the data out into the new environment. All right, and I know we're coming up on um, some time and we want to make sure that we have some more uh, Q&A type um, discussions. Um, let's jump into the uh, latter use case. Uh, this is an example of you may have uh, a, a specific business unit that's uh, able to do something new. Uh, you may have uh, a new uh, company that's, you know, I'll call it born in the cloud to begin with. Uh, whatever the reason, uh, you have the ability in this case to uh, not be burdened as much by uh, migration, but more of the deployment and adoption and leverage of the cloud uh, state architecture. The uh, biggest benefit here is that it's, it's a really fast time to market deployment, but the challenge here is that you can still do just as many uh, uh, complicated things as you did in the migration by not adopting some of the best practices. And again, that metadata management, that catalog deployment, the end-to-end -end service layer that allows the management of the target environment in an optimized fashion that can be monitored and optimized elastically is very key and very important. So although this looks like an easy uh, use case pattern uh, to deploy, which it can be, uh, it carries with it uh, many of the same liabilities and complexities of uh, transitional transformations. Clark? Yes, Alex, those, uh, those challenges uh, with new state cloud, um, we see those often and, and what a lot of organizations can get overwhelmed with is that this is all brand new and it's different than what they had before. But in many ways, it's it's better when that they have from four. And um, I'm going to start with the last part first and, and work my way up. But having experience can really help there in order to take uh, an existing data source or format, take an existing structure of data or architecture uh, or pipeline, and really being able to revolutionize it in the cloud is important because there's a lot of things to be uh, taken advantage of here that can aid in, in automation. So as different data patterns are understand and we're able to automate those executions, whereas previously they might have been more manual, can help get a jump start on that. And so that uh, those can be more complex tasks like taking data science and operationalizing it. Um, another recommendation here is being able to integrate those uh, business insights. You know, so catalog seems to be the, the word of the day here, but it's extremely important to have that actionable catalog uh, to help understand that data and to be able to make quick use of it. So being able to take the existing work that's done and then adding it into uh, modern processing, which means uh, scalability and distribution of processing, but also by providing that business context uh, allows users to very quickly access the data and start processing it. And that's that's one of the key areas where we see the, the largest uh, lag in time. Uh, the analysts tell us that 80% uh, of a data scientist's time is spent preparing the data, and the other 20% is complaining about the 80% of the time or something like that. But <laughs> it's, you know, with the, the goal here is to speed up that data preparation time. And so by having that understanding and being able to automate things, we get there much quicker. Great. And uh, if we go on to the architecture uh, deployment example of this, uh, what you see here is uh, an example of very similar pattern of deployment, but in an AWS environment. So architecturally, uh, principles are the same. You still have that overall platform to manage services across the platform, the uh, operationalizing that data catalog uh, within that environment, but within the context of, in this case, AWS 
Uh, Clark, if you want to just maybe uh, do a quick uh, touch point of anything that's unique to AWS here, uh, we can then maybe move to some questions, um, discussions. Yeah, I think one of the things that, that hopefully the users are seeing here uh, that are online is that, you know, that, that Zaloni um, set of tasks there just fits in like a glove, and that's on purpose, is that as people are transitioning or going to hybrid or even moving around to clouds, we saw a lot of customers change Hadoop distributions, and we're seeing the same thing in the cloud. Multiple clouds or AWS today and Azure tomorrow as they take advantage of uh, cost of storage or better processing or new features, um, that's what the, the tooling was written to do, was to be flexible in, in its incorporation with different environments. And so here what you see is that um, our zone-based architecture, in this example uh, for a, a customer in the publishing industry, uh, allowed them to migrate their data from landing to raw to sandbox through S3 buckets, but that storage system um, just depends. It, it can be any storage system that AWS supports. We just integrate with it. We're not the data storage system, just like we're not the, the application layer, the BI or the development application layer. We sit right in between to manage and govern that data uh, as it enters the environment and gets prepped for its business usage. Yep, and to that point, uh, one of the things that uh, DNC Platform Managed Services um, allows you to do is to understand what is the best storage environment. And uh, as Clark pointed out, many of our clients uh, migrate uh, even after the first selection and the first experiences. As their business changes, they're able to flex into the new uh, environments that AWS or Azure or any of the cloud providers offer with a lot more flexibility and speed than uh, traditional CapEx type environments. Um, Clark, maybe one thing you can talk about, uh, we have a question here about how this type of uh, solution works well with some of the business challenges that uh, many of our clients are experiencing, uh, constructs like GDPR, um, data protection, and uh, some of the governance um, compliance uh, challenges that uh, we're seeing in relation to uh, data management in general? That's a, that's a great use case, and, and I would say that one of the industries we're, we're strongest in is finance, and they have one of the um, most rigid compliance and regulatory requirements of any industry. Um, and so that goes to a lot of different capabilities. You've got to be able to identify the PII data. You've got to know where it is and be able to, to find it and validate it. And so we use data quality rules that are uh, integrated into the processing application in order to take it right to the data. Don't bring the data to us. Rather, we push that application processing to the data for efficiency to identify um, whether the data is sensitive data or not, like a credit card number or social security number or what have you. And then uh, we provide uh, both masking and tokenization. And so masking uh, is a less rigid form. Uh, users might use that to like hide, let's say, a, a partial birth date where we want to expose the year potentially for some sort of uh, analytic segmentation down the road, but we do want to, you know, obscure um, the full birth date rather than having to, you know, completely transform it. Or if we do need to go more rigid um, and hide a social security number, masking isn't as, as helpful there because then we lose the cardinality of it. And so as we get down, uh, segmenting on uh, uh, social security number that's been masked is much, much harder. Uh, last four digits is not very useful. So we, we provide multiple ways to secure that data, so identify and secure that data, and then work to incorporate with uh, different encryption uh, algorithms and patterns that are available in the environment for system storage uh, so that the data is, is fully secure. And then finally is the reporting of it. You know, we've got to be able to say, for GDPR compliance or, or any type of regulation, you know, where, where did the data come from, how did you change it, and where did it wind up? And so we have full lineage available in the, uh, in the Zaloni tooling to allow us to, to trace that completely. Yeah, and the idea here is that, uh, especially with GDPR, where uh, compliance has uh, a penalty associated to it, uh, and there's a, a heavy uh, reliance on monitoring capabilities, that lineage, that transparency, uh, but also the ability to provide guidance uh, to your users to ensure that your users are just as educated and protected by how they use the data as uh, your company policies dictate is very important. And that common uh, window pane 
of access allows you to create not only secure limitations on access, but also provide guidance as to how best to make use of that uh, data. One of the things that uh, I really like about um, uh, the combination of the GXC and Zaloni partnership is that uh, it really exposes the control to a broader user environment. So you have things like collaborative uh, crowdsourcing contributions towards metadata. So um, curation is no longer an IT problem or an individual or even like a small group of problem. It is essentially a capability that the entire enterprise can participate in. And that is, I think, the overall goal, and I'll maybe even close out with this message. The overall goal for these type of distribution uh, of platforms and implementation solutions is to get the entire enterprise engaged as opposed to letting the enterprise be governed by the limitations of any one division of it, whether it's by IT or maybe by the, uh, even by some of the business units that may only have partial visibility or knowledge about the data or the technologies. This is the first time we're seeing the ability to truly engage the entire enterprise, uh, get them to participate in operating the technology because it no longer takes uh, a PhD or uh, electrical engineer to uh, navigate from infrastructure to tech, uh, software to data uh, constructs, and then ex essentially make use of that, as Clark pointed out, embedding it or uh, making it actionable. Um, otherwise, uh, knowledge by itself is not really useful. You have to be able to um, make decisions on it that can be acted on, and that action has to be valuable to the enterprise and can be monitored for success to know that that action was truly valuable and it changed or enhanced or saved uh, something about the way you do your business. Clark, anything um, to add? No, that's, that's a great wrap-up. I, I think it's all about having a collaborative strategy, and you know, that goes towards the tooling of being able to have a unified uh, environment to work in where everybody can, you know, be singing from the same song sheet. They can be working from the same application and viewing the same data, uh, but also being able to hand off those tasks. Uh, everybody's bringing different skills to the game here, and we're beyond the days where uh, filling out requirements and handing them into IT and, and having a, you know, a project plan to do that is going to be enough to, to get us to insights quickly. Everybody needs to be working together with a tool set that reflects their particular skills. And so having that self-service data strategy, I, I think, uh, in my experience, over the last five to seven years has been key for organizations being able to achieve uh, quick insights. Great. Thanks, Clark. Um, I think uh, uh, there's lots of information that we've shared, and what we wanted to do is just kind of show you three different types of approaches that are uh, addressing the same problem, but maybe from uh, three different patterns that your organization is more than likely to fall into at least uh, once or twice th uh, throughout its uh, digital transformation journey. Uh, if you have more uh, questions, we invite you to uh, look at some of the DXC and Zaloni self-service analytics platform um, discussions. We, uh, there's a link posted here at the end slide and also in the uh, attachments and links portion of this webinar. Um, there's a couple of blogs on the topic that talks about how, you know, how to prepare uh, yourself for artificial intelligence and AI, as well as some of the um, benefits and approaches towards democratizing data access. And of course, uh, there's lots of information uh, from the Zaloni uh, resources on their site about case studies and how the data catalog construct really changes the paradigm of operating and uh, navigating your data, treating it more of a data asset. Um, and then in the contact information, uh, there's a DXC and a Zaloni link for uh, further contact uh, with questions and discussions. And um, with that, I'll hand it back to Brett. All right. Um, yeah, just to uh, just to finish up here, the the presentation will be available on demand both on Zaloni's Resources Hub and on the Bright Talk Network for future viewing. Uh, the slides will also be attached um, to the presentation in the attachments tab located below the player. 
and with that, uh, I think we'll we'll close it out. Um, I want to thank uh, Clark and Alex for taking the time to speak with us today, um, and thank you for attending. And with that, uh, I think we'll see you next time. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Clark. Thanks, Brett. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, everybody.